of like how to manipulate children, like understanding their psychology and everything, and like seeing that that's sort of used in weird ways. And you know, there's been like well, people don't like, understand. Um, there's a whole industry behind the psychology of getting people involved in, um, first off, alcoholism, um, lottery use, gambling. There's a deep study of these things and what makes the brain engage in these sort of things. I remember I went to ADSAP class because I got a DUI shot. And it was actually illuminating. First off, they, they talked to you about how we don't expect any of you to stop drinking, basically, but we're going to teach you how not to get a DUI. And each drink you take uh, basically will expire after one hour, and your blood alcohol level will go down after one hour. But they went into the advertising behind alcohol. And what, for, and they also broke down that first off, um, 90, you know how alcohol companies stay in business? It's through alcoholics. It's not the people who drink socially. The people who keep beer companies, alcohol companies, and business are the real alcoholics. The 10% of their customer base, the ones who are completely addicted and who are, you know, buying drinks every day, buying bottles every day, that's who it's marketed to. But they went into uh, the things that drive, um, drinkers basically these ads the things that influence them and uh rebellion against authority was one of them uh that was definitely one of them um you never see anybody drunk in any alcohol ad you can't show me any alcohol ad you can't show me any alcohol ad where somebody is actually drunk because they never are. They're with friends, they're hanging out, they're having a good time, they're having a couple brews, maybe they're having a drink at the bar, and they're out on a fun night, and somehow they meet this hot girl on an elevator, and you never know where it's gonna bring you, and you never know where it's gonna take you. They never show the dark side of alcoholism. They never show anybody just like sloshed. They don't even show people drunk. They don't even show people buzzed. They're, they're just drinking and they're like normal people, right? And, and that's it was so illuminating to me. Cent I didn't stop drinking, but. We just had a mass stabbing in the UK. It was at a children's club. Yeah, no, we have that. summer holidays now. One dead and eight injured. Seems it was the usual. Yeah, I have that pulled up, but actually. The news won't mention it. I have that pulled up, actually. And we're going to cover that later in the show, but. Um, yeah, they had a, they they were covering that live, um, and so we are gonna probably go over that at some point. Um, yeah, probably the usual suspect, but yeah, the most interesting man in the world. Yeah, everything but being an alcoholic was interesting about him, right? And and if you don't believe what I'm saying, find me any ad for any beer or alcohol company where somebody's drunk. And it usually ends up in a wild night. They're never drunk, though, by the way. And they run into this hot chick, and they exchange glances across the bar, and all of a sudden they're in the elevator getting it on. It's, yeah, it's like soda commercials for grown-ups. And they're rebelling against authority. They're doing something they're not supposed to be doing, perhaps, in some of these alcohol ads. They press stop on the elevator so they can make out and fuck in the elevator, right? So... These are all things that they deeply studied for years and years and years um, to understand why, you know, what could get people to drink more. Um, I wonder if I could find a video of this. But the same thing can be said. Facebook did the same thing. Twitter has done the same thing. Social media did the same thing where they did studies on how they could get people to use these apps more. What provided the most dopamine hits? How could they keep them on the site the longest? And very similar uh, to what I'm talking about with the, with the alcohol ads, right? 
um, and Facebook's been exposed for this, but they've all done it. And they figured out that it's very powerful. Uh, you know, the dopamine rush, the constant, and TikTok seems to have mastered it, honestly. I don't fuck with TikTok, but, um, you know, Twitter, I'm on Twitter all the time. Uh, and I would even go so far as to say sometimes, yeah, it's like an addiction uh, to be on Twitter. But they all studied this. And I wouldn't be surprised to learn that, that Dr. Beast, uh, Dr. Beast, Mr. Beast, faggot beast, Mark of the Beast, uh, had done a lot of studying into, or at least a lot of research into studies that had already been done on the psychology of children who are even easier to manipulate than adults and how he can make money off them. You think this guy's giving away millions of dollars to better the world? Like, this is all just fucking, like, pie-in-the-sky bullshit. He was doing it to be the biggest YouTuber in the world, to be one of the richest men in the world. That's what it's about. You think this guy gives a fuck? Like, I mean, there's tons of research on human psychology and what makes them engage in vice and the 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 traits that are more likely to get them to engage in vice. Yeah, here it is right here. I'll call on the media. Uh, now this is um this is an article. Um, I'm looking to see here. Um, and and of course, television is shown to children as well. <laughs> Right, and they don't just skip the beer ads. When I was a kid, the beer ads were like the coolest thing ever. You know, Budweiser and all this shit. Like that was the that was the thing. Like those were the those were the ads you wanted to see. Um, but anyway, I, I'll try. I'll see if I can find a video on that because I, I don't want to get too distracted. But there's a ton of research on all this stuff. Based friend sent $2 on Rumble. Rap music as a kid helped me start drinking as a kid. Yes. All the rappers had pussy money and endless weed. Well, I ain't gonna lie, rap music got me deep into drug culture. Do you think that was an accident? A lot of these motherfuckers were either ex-drug dealers or sponsored by drug dealers. Now, do you think it was an accident? They're always talking about drugs and their night out and... All the pussy they're getting and, you know, how great lean is and, God, let me smoke this blunt and mm, cocaine's great. Do you think Do you think it's an accident that youth listening to that would get into that culture? Now, I you know, at the end of the day, it's your own choice. But I grew up heavily ensconced in that culture. You know, 3-6 Mafia, they're drug rappers. Like, what the fuck? Um, you know, is there any wonder that I got deep into that? Still, it's my ultimate responsibility, but what I'm saying is uh, media definitely has an effect on you. And they figured out the traits, the alcohol companies at least. I remember this presentation. I was just blown away. Because out of the five, the four or five traits, and a couple of them I forgot. That's why I'm looking for the list. Um, but re rebelliousness um, was one. Uh, spontaneity was another. Um, uh, like uh, not rebellious. I already said rebelliousness, but um, lack of respect for authority was another one. They figured all this shit out. North eighty one eighty one sent three dollars on Rumble. In the UK, drinking is not as serious as the US. I was working as glass collector in a bar at fourteen. That meant I was out drinking at fifteen. My parents were fine with it. Just don't smoke lol. Yeah, the UK is a country of alcoholics. I hate to tell you that, North, but um, the UK arguably has a more serious drinking problem than the United States. <laughs> um, and I've been in the UK. And so, uh, oh, there's Goofus. What's up? I had to mod you so they didn't fuck with you anymore. Uh, but the UK is a country of alcoholics. And it's, in, it's just ingrained in their culture. Uh, Russia, too. Like, there's a lot of countries like that. Now, it's not to say there's not plenty of alcoholics in the United States. There are. Um, and outside the United States. Um, but, you know, it's ingrained from a very young age. 
uh, in the UK to drink and to drink to oblivion. Like you see these videos, you bitches just passed out in the street. Da, da, da. Not that you don't see it elsewhere, but there's a real drinking culture in the in the UK. Like Brits drink more beer than liquor, it seems. Yeah, it does seem that way. Um, that might be true. Um, they love gin. They do love the gin. Yeah, but country music promotes the shit out of booze. Sometimes drugs. Yeah, like, and you can see all this and know all this, and you're still not immune to it. Like somebody in chat said, like I saw this presentation and I was just blown away. Like, well, I hit like four out of the five check marks of somebody who would be very susceptible to being an alcoholic. And I have been exposed to alcoholic propaganda, alcohol propaganda my entire life and had an alcoholic father. And it's like, mm, how did I North become an alcoholic? One sent $3 on Rumble. <laughs> Why else would you drink Ralph just to get fucked up? Well, see, that's the thing. That's the other thing um, that they talked about. Most people just drink until they have a little buzz gone. They're a little happy or whatever, you know, two, three, maybe four drinks. But an alcoholic, the ones who keep the industry afloat, who are the ones they're really trying to, it's, it's a drug dealer is what it is. Alcohol is a drug. The ones they really run the business off of are the alcoholics. And I, you know, I guess I got this from my dad from a certain perspective, but my dad never like sat down and just had one or two drinks that I witnessed maybe once or twice. Right. I remember my dad telling me why, what else would you drink except to get drunk? Well, that's the precise opposite <laughs> way you should feel about drinking. You should drink to, you know, ease your, you know, social anxieties, have a little bit of fun but not to excess. But my dad, I remember him telling me, what else would you drink to get, except to get drunk? That's not why you should drink. <laughs> I remember him telling me, uh, he would, he would never eat before he drank, which is not good for your stomach. And it's also not good because the alcohol if you don't eat before you drink, it soaks just directly into you and you get way drunker, a lot faster. I was taught that. I was like, never eat before you drink. What are you, moron? You eat after you drink. And that's, that's an alcoholic move. And I remember, I think I was watching a, a episode of Mad Men or something. Or no, it was the same class. No, it was the same. It was the ATSAP class. And they said one of the signs you know you're an alcoholic is when you only buy a certain amount of alcohol. Like you don't buy the big bottle on purpose. Like some people can buy a big bottle and it lasts them for a month, right? Because they only have a couple drinks here and there or whatever. But one of the signs you're an alcoholic is, and we'll get into the Mr. B stuff here in a second. I just find this fascinating is that you don't buy the big bottle on purpose because you know that if you buy the big bottle, you're going to drink that big bottle, if not the whole thing, a damn good majority of it, right? And so you're, you're preemptively stopping yourself. This is a sign of an alcoholic. You're preemptively stopping yourself from, from drinking more because you know, because subconsciously you know you have a problem. Right? If I buy it, it's getting drank. Right? Like, that's the thing. Yes, exactly. And so you're preemptively stopping yourself. Another sign of an alcoholic, of course, you've seen, you know, I've lived some of this out in public, sober now, not that long, uh, you know, uh, but back on the path is you're constantly quitting and restarting alcohol. Or you're quitting for a month and then you're starting back and, you know, taking breaks from alcohol and, you know, oh, I'll just take a break here and there and da-da-da, I'm back on it. Well, normal people who are not alcoholics just, they just have a beer every once in a while 
or maybe they go out on the weekends or a couple times a you know after work per week and they have two or three beers and that's it they don't they don't really stop drinking because they're not alcoholics <laughs> So one of the main signs of you being an alcoholic is, is like, actually, like, I have to stop. Now, the ultimate is stopping forever, right? Like, you know, okay, I know I'm an alcoholic. I can't drink. But there's also the coping alcoholic where, oh, I'll stop for a month. I'll stop for a few weeks. Uh, and then you're back on it. Right? That's one of the main signs of being an alcoholic as well. And so there's all these little uh, things. And I remember watching this video and just being amazed at, at how accurate it was. And you know why? Because they did all the research on it and they already knew all this. They had the, the research that the alcohol companies had done. And it's like, if you do this, if you're, if you're drinking alone, that's another sign of an alcoholic. If you're not out drinking socially, you're just sitting here drinking by yourself. That's the sign of an alcoholic. There's, there's all kinds of, of, you know, I could go through the whole list. I can't remember every single one. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of different um, points on the list. Um, if you're out with people and you're drinking and you're way drunker than everybody else there. And you've had eight drinks and they've had two, right? Like that's another sign. So, Jay Yoba says, anytime you want to stop attacking me, that would be great. Now, I mean, I'm just going through, like, the research was just so North wild to me because it was so dead on. on Rumble. I'm honest, Ralph, I know I'm an alcoholic. Runs in the family. Lost relationships, jobs, and lots of money. But I do love my Stella. Well, you know, I would be the last one to tell somebody not to do drugs or alcohol. I can tell you what it's cost me. Almost everything. But, almost. But, you know, yet I still have that will to fight. I still have that will to to want to quit and have went on long streaks and have shown that I can do it. Um, but I can tell you what it's cost me, but not everybody's like me, right? Some people can just have a few beers and, and no big deal. But I can tell you what alcohol, and particularly alcohol mixed with a, 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 little, a little white pill, uh has almost killed me 20 times as and i'm not talking about uh you know medical stuff you know ours all this type of shit you know fights craziness um you know i i should be dead as what i'm telling you right i i told somebody this the other day and they didn't believe me <clears throat> and i said i've almost died about 20 times in my life and they thought I was bullshitting. They thought I was making this up. I was like, no. <laughs> uh, I can think of at least just even minimum 10 times in a car that I've almost died. Uh, much less just craziness elsewhere. And, um, you know, I literally should be dead. Like, you should not be hearing my voice right now. And, you know, of course, I was in one of these moments, and I'm like, I shouldn't even say this on the air because it's a weak spot of mine, but sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and um, I'll pick up my phone to call my mother. And then I'll realize she's dead. This happened to me three times last week, actually. I actually reached for my phone, picked it up, and, and scrolled up like I was going to call my mom. And then I remembered, oh, she's dead i can't call my mom uh and that's a soul crushing feeling <laughs> and then you it's like you forget like i'll wake up in the middle of the night it's like oh, i want to talk to my mom okay i'll just call her up and it's like no you can't call her up dead uh and so and all these things are possible to beat and, and there's you know Times I've beaten them, uh, even recently. Uh, but you really can't slip. Uh, if you really want to beat it. Now, if you don't want to beat it, you just want to drink. Like, I, I'd be the last one to try to spoil somebody's fun. Drink all you want. Like, I don't give a fuck. Um, that's how I live my life. Uh, 
for large stretches of it, uh, doing whatever the fuck I wanted. But uh, it is beatable. You just have to stay on top of it. I've said all this shit on air before. You have to stay on top of it. People wanted me to get rid of the breathalyzer. Well, there's a reason I don't. Uh, and because it keeps me honest. Uh, and, you know, until I try to get slick, you guys, and you, and people, the real G's could tell, honestly. All of a sudden, oh, it's just a, you know, a forgotten test at the start. Or, oh, he, he you know, got a delivery and he, and he didn't take one when he came back. Right? Like the real motherfuckers who are perceptive could actually tell. Oh, he just got a he just got an Uber delivery and we're about to watch something. Uh and oh he had to step off camera, he had to go feed his cat for a minute. Uh yeah, I just had I I gotta go feed my cat for a minute. Uh, I'll be right back. And I would take the test before. And then I'd be like, I'm gonna go feed my cat for a minute. And then I would whoosh, down one. I'm I mean when I mean down, I mean like down a whole uh like pint and like a beer or two and when you're a real drinker that's the type of shit you can do uh and it's like there's also a, a part of what i was talking about earlier um you know the rebelliousness the the getting one over on the man getting one over on somebody thinking you're you're a trickster and you've you pulled off the con, not the fake cancer con, but the, you've tricked the people. And really who you're tricking is yourself, right? You're, 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 you're tricking your own brain, right? Um, th there's nobody, you're, you're fucking yourself over. It's, it's not that you're conning anybody else. Mr. Man said, I could always tell. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, I just got this, you know, this food just came in. I, I got to go feed my cat. Let me take this breathalyzer real quick just to prove it. And then I would go feed the cat, but then I would step off camera. And that's why, I like, I'm trying to be, like, really rigorous with it now. But I would step off camera, and, you know, tequila is, like, you know, dirt cheap here. Uh, down half a pint of tequila, like two Heineken's maybe a party favor uh and okay now it's time to watch the movie i took the breathalyzer we're all good let's go and so that's the type of shit you get into when you're when you're lying to yourself um and you're lying to the people too but really who you're lying to is yourself right um and you're really tricking yourself i know this will be clipped by a logs and and this and that but i don't really mind it because i like speaking honestly about my life and uh i think in reality that's what connects me with the people who are here watching me now uh because i don't put on fake airs uh you know have i told some untruths about my usage here and there yeah but that's a symptom of it too right um and you know i i always come out and tell it eventually but that's a symptom of it too. It's like you don't want you don't want people to know because you want them to to feel like you're still on it, right? You're still on the right path. Um, but the real G's always know. Some people don't. Some people can't tell. But the real G's and a lot of them are ex drinkers or current drinkers can always tell. And it just doesn't add up either, logically. It's like, well, why did he take the test now, step off camera, then come back, then he didn't take another test? Like, it, it doesn't make any sense, right? So, um, it, it's not logically consistent. It's like, well, why wouldn't he wait until after he fed the cat and then come back and take the test? Why would he take the test first, then go feed the cat, then come back, and then he's off camera a little bit longer than it would take to feed the cat, but not much longer because I'll be down on him. And so it, it doesn't make it doesn't make logical sense, right? Like if you're really trying to prove something uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you would take it when you got back, fully back. But the reason I didn't take it then is because it would have been, you know, a point oh nine or some shit, right? Uh, so. Yeah, you're right. The Zans are the most obvious. Uh, and the funny thing about 
and I'll and I'll cut this short because I really do want to get into the Mr. Beast thing. Although the numbers seem to have went up when I started talking the real shit. Um, the the thing about Xanax is, um, go ahead. North eighty one eighty one sent three dollars on Rumble. What can I pick you up, Ralph? Just off to do a beer run. Nothing for me today, sir. Uh, and nothing for me for hopefully forever. Uh, but you know. Um, I'd be a fool to sit here and say, you know, uh, I have it all under control and I have, uh, for the past several period here, I don't know, what's it been a, it's been a week now, I guess, uh, two, I don't, I don't know. I haven't been counting the days. Um, what day was it? I have to go back and look through the shows. Um, actually, if I really wanted to know how long has it been? Um, let me see, because I can count the shows and tell you, um, yeah, since the, um, since Sunday, so it's been about a, it's been about a week, so a little bit over a week since, since Sunday, so, um, you know, that's not exactly anything to, um, you know, brag about, but, um, not yesterday. I mean, the Sunday before that. So, um, but the thing about Xanax, um, you know, I'm, I'm prescribed Xanax, uh, and if taken normally, Xanax actually, of course, it's not hard to get one of those here, but, if taken normally, and why I was originally drawn to Xanax is, um, it it does calm you. It does um, kind of block out intrusive thoughts. Um, it keeps you calmer. I have a tendency to get worked up. I know it's a shock, uh, or to get deep into my thoughts. Like it can kind of help block that out. It does kill anxiety. It does kill, perhaps maybe some, you know. Um, I feel like I have PTSD basically from like deaths in my life, my grandmother and my mother and my father and stuff like that. Um, it does block that stuff out. It it really does work. It's a very effective drug. Now there, the only downside is once you start taking it every day, you can't stop. Well, you can, you have to just have to taper, but you're basically, you basically have to take it every day. And the other thing is I found out when I, first got exposed to Xanax as a teenager was that if you mix Xanax, Xanax by itself doesn't really do anything. It can be used as a sleep aid or to calm anxiety. Those are the only two things that it really does. It doesn't fuck you up. Like I've never taken a Xanax without a drink and been like, I'm fucked up. Never in my life. But I was shown when I was a, a teenager, maybe like 16 or so, that if I took a Xanax, and yeah, it hides the pain, but it doesn't take it away permanently. Yeah, it makes it manageable. But I was shown that if I took a Xanax and drank with it, that it's immediate uh, euphoria to use the Kendrick Lamar track. Um, it's a feeling that I, I can't really describe. Um, now, it can quickly turn into uh, destroy you, not euphoria, uh, as you go along through the, through the night. But the, the two things mixed in together, and people died off this. Like, I've seen people worried about me dying, like, off shit like that. No, nah, that wouldn't take me out. Um, but <laughs> too much experience there. But um, the immediate feeling of euphoria when you mix alcohol and Xanax, um, I was taught that um, really at a young age. But Xanax by itself never fucked with me. Uh, and never has. Uh, now, I don't want to be on it anyway, because just having it around, because I know what it does, right? I know what it does with alcohol. And so, like, it's not an effective tool for me. Even though it does work and basically, you know, alleviates any, like, or most bad symptoms I would have, you know, in my thoughts, but I know what it does and just having it around, it's like, hey, go pick up a little something, you know, you know what you need, right? Um, 
it, yeah, it does. It's, it makes life easier. Yeah, it really does. Um, but it, but you don't have to feel, um, and that's what, that's what the real problem with, with Xanax is. And it's particularly when you mix it with alcohol, you mix, and that's how I got back on it in the, in the fall of, uh, 2022 and then stopped and then got back on it early 2023, um, is you, you take it to not have to feel because you don't have to feel particularly if you drink on it 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 kills it kills those 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 feelings of pain and that's not how you're supposed to live life dixie respecter sent five dollars on rumble that's my fave thing about xanax is when it's kicking in those voices of doubt and uncertainty in your head the anxiety it's like turning down the radio and then there is just silence yes yeah, and that's what it does. It's an effective product. I mean, drugs sell themselves, really. Like Richard Breyer said that, but that you know, they don't run ads for what well, they do for some of these drugs. But like he was talking about cocaine and shit like that. It's like, well, they're effective products. They work. Uh, they don't really need to run ads for these. Um, but particularly when you mix, and I already knew this, and it was, I've told this story before. I'll tell it again. And I'll stop. Kioskman sent two dollars on Rumble. Another Mr. Beast vid to pad out to the section. Only like the yeah, first they, 10 minutes they, or so are relevant. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it turns down. It just turns down the radio. And my dog died when I was in Cuba. And no, it wasn't because I left him at the house alone. I didn't do that. Even though that was suggested to me by a person I used to know. Just leave him there and let him make a mess. And I'll clean it up when we get back. Don't worry about it. And I said, no, we can't just leave him here. You know, he'll shit all over the place. Da, da, da. We can't do that. It was my decision. I said, we have to take him and kennel him. And we did, but when we got to the kennel, they said, well, he hadn't had his vaccinations. Um, he was 15 years old. He hadn't had his vax for like a year and a half or some shit. And they said, we, had to, we have to update his vaccinations for him to be able to stay here with these other dogs. And... I said, okay, give him his vac vaccinations. Moon Milk 64 sent $1 on Rumble. Realness is appreciated. Thank you. I, and I appreciate you. Uh, and I said, so go ahead. All right, update his vaccination. And they were sending me pictures of him while we were in Cuba, etc. cetera. Uh, and they sent me one picture and he just didn't look good. He looked ill, basically. Wasn't happy. You could just tell he just didn't look good. And, you know, then they said, they called and they said he's sick. And we got the vet in here and we're, we're doing every, everything we can to save him. But it, it's like he's had, a, and I didn't know this, by the way, but if you have an older dog, don't get him vaccinated. Um, because um, it can cause, there's stories about this. You can Google this. Um, it can cause your dog, like, they don't really need it when they're that old um and it can cause like adverse reactions in your dog particularly older dogs that'll kill them now, i didn't know this at the time i thought i was doing the right thing and so when i went um i was in cuba and they called me and they told me my dog died in the middle of, 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 of havana and my dog of 15 years and lived with me and my mom was like you know going back to 2008 and it was like my mom had died all over again. Uh, and it just really fucked with me bad, really bad. And I, I got back and, uh, first they were going to let me see him. And then they said, uh, no, it's changed the policy. You can't see him, but he's in the other room. And of course I cried like a, like a baby, uh, at, at the, at the vet clinic and well, the kennel and they were vet too. But I said to myself, I can't release this information because the A-laws are going to use it against me. And they're going to say, I left my dog in the house to die. Uh, and so I can't tell people that he's dead. And I just have to act like he's still alive. This is like a sickness. This is the sick part of the business, right? I was like, I can't tell people this because it'll be used against me. And the person I used to know knows this is true. Uh, their attack dog on Twitter knows this is true. 
Um, I have records that prove it's true uh, as well. But and to their credit, they went with me and were there with me. And while I was crying, it was like a it's like a death in the family. It was a death in the family. And they took a trip uh, a month later. Person I used to know. Uh, and I could have went, but I, you know, I didn't want to kennel the cats. And, I, you know, I was still kind of like, I, can't, I, I just, I need to work. I need to stay here and make money. Um, you know, you go do your thing. Congratulations on your achievement. And, you know, I'll be watching, which I did. And um, on the internet. And something kept going through my mind. And it was about how easy it was to get Xanax in Mexico. And and this person I used to know said, don't ever get back on you know, that. You know, I can't handle that. Um, and I said, no, of course not. Yeah, I know. Of course, never. Like, I, I know how bad Xanax is. But I was driving around. I was by myself. They were gone. And... I said, you know what? Let me just stop by this clinic just to see if that's true. It really is that easy to get Xanax here. And I walked into the clinic and I said, you know, I had a prescription for Xanax when I was in the United States. I don't have the paperwork right now, uh, but I used to have a prescription for Xanax and can I get, you know, another prescription? And I think she kind of knew I was bullshitting, so she only gave me the one milligram. Now, later on, that it makes a problem because uh, they really don't care. But not that they're evil; they just—it's not really as big a thing here. And um, so I got on the Xanax, and and, and the, I was still drinking at the time, and it, it immediately did take it away. It made you forget; like I didn't have to think about it anymore. It blocked it out of my mind. And this person I used to know, of course, there was all kinds of drama when they got back, and I won't go through all that. It's out there. But, um, you know, those things wouldn't have happened had I not been on you know, Xanax, basically, alcohol. Um, but they, they told me, they recounted a story to me about what somebody they knew had said. And I said, give me the phone. I want to have a chat. And I had a chat. And uh, it wasn't the, it didn't go that well. Let's just put it that way. And some things were destroyed, and a very important thing was destroyed. And um, anyway, this person I used to know sat there with me while I went through Xanax withdrawals, to their credit, and basically nursed me through it. This is a true story. By Anonymous the way. sent three dollars. I was told by some retard that Ralph put puppies into an oven. It was so over the top That's of so an stupid. accusation. I guess I should ask you, have you ever baked puppies? No, we had a at-home incubator. Um, the puppies were born premature, and so there was a heating pad in the oven, and they were in a shoebox. This is something you can look up too. By the way, most people don't have an incubator at their house. Uh, so we put heating pads, uh, in the shoe box and one underneath, um, turned down a little bit lower. Um, and you don't close the oven, you leave the oven cracked so that oxygen can get in, right? The, the oven's not closed. It's, it's a makeshift incubator. You can look this up online. Uh, like this is what you do basically to try to save premature puppies if you don't have an incubator, which most people don't. Um, and unfortunately, um, the puppies died anyway, um, but no, I didn't bake or gas any puppies. Um, and those were puppies from my childhood dog, who was also 15 years old when she died in the middle of the street. Somebody ran her over and uh, didn't stop, didn't say anything, which was like losing a fan. I was like, <laughs> like losing its tug, except it was even worse uh, because my childhood dog it was everything to me. I would have died for that dog. Uh, anyway. Um, but no, uh, I didn't bake any puppies or anything like that. Um, but this person I used to know um, sat there with me through the withdrawals. I was like, no, don't get more. Just take it. Like, I'll, I'll be here if you have any seizure, whatever. And to their credit, they were. And then I went on. We did Ralphamania. It was a great success. 
Everybody loved it. It was a lot of fun. And for some reason, I, th I guess it's just self-sabotage, honestly. For some reason that I still cannot actually pinpoint, I guess I just wasn't over. Uh, the dog dying and really my mom dying. Um, I went and got more Xanax. And got on it a lot heavier than the one milligram. Like I was... I was back on it, the old days, and everybody saw that play out on air and everything. Um, but I still can't really remember why I did that. I just think I just still couldn't handle it. Um, but you, you have to learn how to handle it. I mean, life is about handling and dealing and being able to feel like, yeah, you can take these things to kill the the feelings but that's not what life is life is suffering as they say you have to learn how to self-soothe how to um not rely on these things to get by but i just came off one of the biggest successes of my career and it's like why why would you why would you do that to yourself and i still can't tell you why to be honest um Except that I just wasn't over it. And, um, basically torpedoed my life. Uh, another torpedo. <laughs> and then another. And it's like, okay, well, you can only take so many submarines, can only take so many, uh, torpedoes. Uh, and then they sink to the bottom of the ocean. And so, you know, you always got to pay the price. Yeah, you can't run from your feelings forever. Um, you can try, but you're going to pay the price, and it's going to be your life being fucked up. It's going to be court proceedings. It's going to be fighting to see your kids. It's going to be um, death, possibly, jail. You know, there are a lot of different permutations, different paths, as they say, character paths and RPG. Um, but you can't run forever. Uh, you can run for a long, long time, but you can't run forever. So anyway, I'll stop with the reveals there. But yeah, that's what happened. And the sickest part to me um, was these people knew how my dog died. And then they tried to lie about it later on. And they knew exactly what happened to the dog. It was a vaccine reaction. And I didn't tell people just because I knew it would be spun as something that I did. You know, my fault or I left them by themselves. So I didn't tell people Tug died until I had the Xanax relapse in December, the first one that I was able to get off of. Then I told people my dog died. And so I needed to to take some time off. But what I was really doing was taking time off to come off Xanax. And I couldn't be on air like that because I have vocal tics and like it's like a lot of different, I just can't be myself. And so, so I did lie about the timing of his death. Uh, and I used that as an excuse to stay off the air um, because I felt like I couldn't tell the truth. And you know, I regret that now. I wish I would have just told people what would have happened or what happened. But, um, you know, trying to outfox people. We're trying to keep this negative black PR away. And I should have just told people because the same confidants, quote unquote, who, who knew exactly what happened, lied about it later on when they wanted to use it against me. And I can't blame anybody but myself. Because I knew better. I should have just told the truth. I should have just told the truth. But uh, you know, you think you think you're getting you think you're getting one over. And um I didn't. <laughs> Soberman sent ten dollars Dark Ninja still lying about his teenage dating server. I don't know Dark Ninja really. But... Thank you, Hermit. I appreciate that. 
Sorry to derail the whole show with that. But I don't know that I've ever told the full story on that whole thing, but... And by the way, I gave that person that I used to know, who I obviously don't care for any longer, credit for the good things they did during that time. Um, and I did some bad things myself. So, not that they didn't do any, but. Alright, enough! Get up! Also, where's my water? Real water, not vodka. Thank you, Theta. I'll take that as a compliment. I wish I would have never went to Cuba. I'll say that. Even though Havana is beautiful, or used to be. But. Because it fucked up my whole life. Anonymous sent $3. Appreciate the real talk, Ralph. I'm a functional drug addict and live by a set of rules, so I keep myself in check. I got locked up for it at one point. I've made peace with being a scumbag. Yeah, and, you know, you can be Anonymous a functional one. three dollars. We just lost a warrior of light drugs. His name was Crack Rock Chris. He was a winger with no limits. Could you play the first five men of this? Yeah, I could. Um, I wish I hadn't went to Cuba because then my dog would have never went to that kennel. And you know what? That person that I used to know, I could have just left him in the house. And, you know, he was old. You know, he, he might be gone by now anyway. But, um, you know, I could, I could have listened to their advice and, and just left him in the house. He would have been safer in the house than taking that fucking vaccine. That's for damn sure. So, um, and I blame myself. And that was another thing. Like I blame us. I blame myself for it too. And I was like, it was me that did this. It was me that made this decision. It was me that overruled this other person. And it was my fault. And then, you know, almost getting stuck in Cuba. Uh, and it was a whole, it was a whole thing getting back. And there was only one flight back and it's communist Cuba. And it's like, might have to stay for days. And I'm arguing with the agent. All the agents work for the government there. And, and like, I got into it with them and it's not like the U S and, and she's just like, well, do you want my help to go home? Or do you want me to hang up this phone right now? And you can just sit it out here in Cuba. I was like, I want your help. North 8181 <laughs> sent $3 on Rumble. Blue-eyed PPL are more prone to alcoholism. I have two brothers, one blue-eyed, the other brown. Brown ID bro ends up with major hangovers. My lil blue-eyed bro is a drinker like me at North 8181. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I didn't know that actually. But all the, all the airline, like, People at the desk, they all work for the Cuban government. No matter which airline they represent, they all work for the Cuban government. And um, there were a couple of passengers with me. One of them, um, I was, uh, no problem flying from Mexico. But on the way back, they're like, well, you don't have this piece of paper. And I'm like, well, it's a, a small connection, I'll say. And it's like, can you not just put them on the flight? Like, what's going on? They're like, no, you don't have this. We have to call the central office in Mexico and all this and that. And I was pissed, and I got into it with her. And she was not going to help me. And I literally begged. I was just like, please, God, my dog just died. I'm stuck here in Cuba. I have to get back to Merida. Can you please help me? I'm sorry. 
for every bad thing that I said to you. And I was being honest too. Um, can you please just help me help us? And, um, to her credit, she did. So yeah, that's the whole, that's the whole Cuba story. Um, and, um, no, uh, it was just a vaccine reaction. I will say, uh, if you got an older dog, don't give them vaccines. That would be my, that would be my advice. Cause if you look this up, there's tons of stories about people who have older dogs and animals um, having like adverse vaccine reactions. Of course, I didn't take the COVID vaccine like Medicare and PPP and Worski and all this. So I should have already been like, fuck this, I guess. But it's, a, it's an animal, you know, as far as I know, these vaccines are safe. You know, my animal's been taking them their whole lives, right? Like, I'm like, okay, no big deal. Just, you know, give them updated vac vaxes, right? It's okay. Um, but he was old and he had an adverse reaction and they actually made him sick and he died. Um, he wasn't by himself. <clears throat> he wasn't by himself. Actually, they, they had a couple of, um, vet techs in there with him so that he wouldn't die by himself. Um, but it reminded me of my mom so much because um, I couldn't see my mom when she died either because of the CDC regulation, the 10 day thing, and she died on the 10th day. And so it was like a replay of my mom dying. Uh, and it just, I think about it now, it makes me want to cry. Um, but I won't, I'll stop myself. A thousands of dollars. Thank you for watching this clip by Colonel J. This is the King of Bold here. Remember to like and subscribe. Juice.